after 9-11, this Islamophobia kept growing. And the reason was, I'm sorry to say, that we, the Muslim countries, did not do anything to check this wrong narrative. How can any religion have anything to do with terrorism? How was Islam equated with terrorism? And once that happens, how is the man in the street in Western countries, how is he supposed to differentiate between a moderate mus Muslim and a radical Muslim? How can he dif differentiate? Hence, this man walks into a mosque and shoots everyone, everyone he could. Unfortunately, what should have been done and wasn't, the heads of Muslim countries should have taken a stand on this. But instead, a lot of our heads of state kept saying things like, well, we are moderate. The moment you say you're a moderate Muslim, you automatically say that there is some uh, extreme form of Islam. Our head of state at the time, after 9-11, he, he coined a phrase called enlightened moderation. I understand English better than most. I still don't know what it means. Enlightened moderation was a term to appease those who were relating terrorism to Islam. And unfortunately, as a result, there was this perception that there are different types of Islam. There's some radical Islam, there's some moderate, there's some liberal Islam. There is only one Islam, Islam of a Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no other Islam. In human communities, in every human community, you have your moderates, you have your liberals, you have your conservatives, it's a, you have your fanatics. Every human community has that. The man who walked into the mosque in New Zealand clearly was not a normal person. So, but why no other human community was branded with their religion? 1.5 billion people branded by this, these terms. And I'm, they always should be self-criticism because that's how you improve. Unless you analyze your mistakes, you can't improve yourself. So that was the biggest mistake we made. We did not challenge this narrative. And guess who suffered? Muslims living in Western countries. They kept suffering. Because any incident would happen, any terrorist incident by a Muslim immediately meant that every Muslim became branded. When 9-11 happened, I still remember People were petrified in Pakistan that I hope there was no Pakistani involved. How could we res be responsible? How could whole community be responsible for some fanatical deed by some extremists? So therefore, this was a big, it was one of the worst periods for Muslims living in uh, non-Muslim countries. And then, In 1989, there was a book called Satanic Verses written by a, a Muslim who knew, because he came from a Muslim family, he knew the reaction in the Muslim world amongst the Muslims if he insulted or mocked or ridiculed a holy prophet, peace be upon him. But what happened after 1989 was Rather than again the Muslim world coming up with an intellectual narrative trying to explain to them that why do we feel, why are we so hurt when a holy prophet is ridiculed? Why does it hurt us so much? Living in and knowing the Western societies, I knew why they couldn't understand because they do not treat religion like we do. Jesus Christ does not, is not treated the way we, in the West, the way we treat our holy prophet here. So they couldn't understand what was going on. Why were the demonstrations? 
Why were there death threats to Salman Rushdie? So they kept thinking that the Muslims do not allow freedom of expression. So Muslim world is intolerant. It doesn't allow freedom of expression. They were able to vilify our religion. And yet there was no coherent response from the Muslim world. And therefore, we kept into the cycle every few years, there would be some cartoons, insulting cartoons against our prophet. Every few years, there would be something uh, insulting him. We would respond. There would be some act of extremists. They would not respond. So this Islamophobia, the cycle kept getting worse. And poor Muslims living in Western societies kept suffering. So that's why I'm really pleased that for the first time it has been acknowledged that Islamophobia is a reality and something needs to be done about it. And from now onwards, we hope that we will be able to put forward a narrative that why it hurts us so much. In the history of mankind, there was never a more just and humane, humane state. Unfortunately, our children don't know, know about it. We, even we in Muslim countries don't know that the modern state our Prophet created. Forget about Western countries or non-Muslims. How would they know about it when we ourselves don't understand that he created a state which laid the foundation of one of the greatest civilizations in human history for the next few hundred years. And that foundation was laid in the state of Medina. So what was that foundation? This is again what most people don't understand. And I'm glad that Foreign Minister Wang Yi is here because I, I want people to understand what was it that caused this great revolution, one of the greatest revolutions of all times. The state of Medina was one of the greatest revolutions. What was it? Number one, our prophet was given the title in our holy book, the Quran, as Rahmatul Alameen, mercy for mankind, not mercy for Muslims. He came as a mercy for mankind. He came to unite mankind not divide mankind. Uh, Allah, for Muslims, is Rahmat, Rabbul Alameen, not Rabbul Muslimin. We do not understand, we Muslims don't understand the great mission our Prophet came in this world for, to unite humanity. The Charter of Medina was signed with Jews, with Christians, with Sabians, and with pagans. All became part of a human community. We don't even realize that in 10 years which the Prophet came to Medina and then he left this world, people think that it was, you know, through conquests and through, through the sword. Hardly anyone knows that in these 10 years, there were only about 1,200 people who were killed in battles. In these 10 years, 1,200 people died and Islam spread all over Arabia. So it was a revolution of ideas. He created a new system. It's the state of Medina, he created the best rule of law. The basis of a, a civilized society is rule of law. His saying that even if my daughter commits a crime, she will be punished. No one is above law. His saying that many nations before you have been destroyed where the powerful crooks were exempted, were given immunity, and poor crooks were put into jail. If you look at the world right now, excellencies, I can tell you, just look at all the poor countries. Look at the countries which have poverty. There will be one thing in common. They cannot catch the white collar criminals. They only end up putting petty criminals in jail. This is the biggest problem which a prophet, peace be, 
upon him predicted almost 1500 years ago. The developing world is poor, not because they lack resources, because they cannot put the powerful criminals on, uh, in jail. Uh, there's a fact I panel report by Secretary General of the United Nations. According to this report, and this will shock all of you, that every year, every year, $1.6 trillion leave the poor countries and end up in tax havens and in the developed world. $1.6 trillion, according to the fact type panel report of the UN Secretary General. Just imagine what is going on. Poor countries are being robbed simply because we cannot put the powerful criminals in jail. We cannot bring them under the rule of law. This is what our prophet predicted. And this, this was the state of Medina where he set up this system of rule of law, no one above. And, and two of the first four Khalifas, two of the first four heads of state of Medina ended up in court of law. And one of the most revered and respected figures of Islam, who was the fourth Khalifa, he loses a case against a Jewish citizen because the judge refused to accept the testimony of his son. This was the justice system there, which laid the foundation of this great civilization. So what does it show? Number one. Number one that minorities were equal citizens. They were equal citizens in front of law. There was no discrimination. Secondly, it shows that a common citizen could win a case against the head of state. No one was above law. This is 600 years before the Magna Carta was uh, 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 signed in, in England. Uh, which was the beginning of the democratic struggle of, the, of Britain. And it took them years before they could actually bring their head of state under the rule of law. This is what happened in the state of Medina. It was ahead of its time. And then it was the first welfare state in the history of mankind. Compassion, humanity. It was a state which took care of its weak, its orphans, its widows, it's poor people. It was the first time pensions were introduced in the state of Medina. They took care of the old people. A compassionate state. A state where they wanted to please the Almighty. How do you please the Almighty Allah? By looking after his human beings, especially the weak. This is what happened in the state of Medina. And today, I feel sad Whenever I go to Scandinavia, I see what a welfare state should be in all over the Muslim world. Look at humanity there. Look at the way they look after the weak. In fact, sometimes I, I'm sad because some, they look after the animals better than some of us look after our human beings. And remember, he's Ramatul Alameen, so whoever listened to his message, Whichever human community will prosper. It doesn't matter because he's, for all humanity, he brought the message of mercy. If you, if you look at Switzerland, in the, in the rule of law index, Switzerland is 99%. 99%. So with hardly any resources, it is one of the most prosperous countries in the world. So as I said, anyone who goes by the model of, the, the model of Medina 